my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Motif Medical. Motif designs insurance eligible products for busy moms. With a focus on innovation and empowerment, Motif's line of breast pumps and maternity compression garments are sophisticated yet discreet and made to support mothers as they navigate new motherhood. Discover why moms are reporting more milk in less time with the Luna breast pump and see how you can get it covered through insurance at motifmedical.com slash birth hour. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking about Motif with Katie Deckard. We also have a super fun announcement. We are running a special campaign to help reach that goal of 1,000 listener supporters via Patreon, and it's a super fun giveaway. You have to be a supporter in order to be entered, and all of our current members are entered, and then anyone who joins will be entered as well, and we have three different winners. The grand prize is valued at over $1,400. It includes a year's supply of diapers from Diaper, D-Y-P-E-R. They're an awesome company that have chemical-free diapers that are biodegradable, and then a bunch of goodies from Ergo Baby, including two carriers, a stroller, sleep sack, swaddle, and a nursing pillow. It's crazy awesome. And then the runner-up will be getting a custom-designed diaper bag from Better Life Bags, as well as a carrier from Ergo Baby. And then the second runner-up will get a carrier from Ergo Baby. So amazing giveaway. You don't want to miss out. And everyone's really a winner because once you become a supporter of the birth hour, you get special perks immediately, including access to our entire archive of episodes, which is over 330 birth stories that are not available to the public membership in our private Facebook group, which is my favorite place on the internet. We have so many good conversations in there. And then you'll get some bonus content, including, um, ask me anything interviews that I'm doing each month and bonus episodes with experts on a variety of topics. Our first one coming up is going to be on the postpartum period and healing and um, depletion and how to deal with that and avoid it. Um, so lots of good stuff happening over there. You can join by going to patreon.com slash birth hour, and it's a great time to join if you want to get entered into this amazing giveaway we're running. All right. So today's guest is Caitlin Shrum. She has been on the podcast two times before. She is um, a fan favorite. She has had a cesarean and then she came on and shared her VBAC and now she's sharing another VBAC story. Caitlin's first two episodes are only available in our archives. So again, another reason to become a supporter. If you want to hear her, um, her first one, she titled learnings from a cascade of interventions. She talks all about how she thinks she got to the point of having a cesarean that she didn't think was necessary. And then her second one is preparations for redemptive VBAC and it's episodes 185 and 244. So those are available in our archives. Once you join Patreon, you get access to all of those right away. All right, let's get on to Caitlin's episode. Hi, Caitlin. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today. Thanks for having me again. So you have been on the podcast before episodes 185. You shared your cesarean birth story, unplanned cesarean, and then, um, 244 was your VBAC, and I have to say you're a listener favorite. So oh, I think so nice. once people knew you were having a third baby, like, are you going to have her back? Are you going to hear another story? <laughs> so of course we had to have you back. Um, and I'm excited to hear how this third one went, but will you just give us a little bit of background on you and then anyone can go listen to those two episodes as well to hear those. Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm Caitlin. I am married to a uh, lovely guy. I think I probably said that in the last one, but, um, (laughs) named Andrew, we have three boys. So I'm heavily outnumbered. (laughs) Cooper is four. Charlie will be two in a couple of weeks, which I cannot believe. And then we have Liam who is like three and a half months now, which I also can't believe. (laughs) Um, but we live in the Bay area. I work for Netflix. I'm an HR business partner, uh, and my husband works at a autonomous vehicle startup, which I know sounds extremely Bay Area. <laughs> and um, yeah, so Cooper Cooper was an unplanned C-section, super straightforward pregnancy. Just went to the hospital too early, got heavily intervened, I should say. Um, 
hopefully that's the proper English. <laughs> yeah, um, your episode was called one, Learnings from a Cascade of Interventions. Yeah, I feel like yes, that sums one, it up pretty well. Yeah, a Cascade of Interventions. One thing led to another, ended up with a C-section, had a really hard time processing that. Pretty much immediately knew I wanted to have a V back if I could. Um, and then with Charlie, I had the unmedicated V-back of my dreams, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then Liam came into our lives a bit unexpected, which I could yeah. talk about. So how old was Charlie when you found out you were pregnant with Liam? Uh, he had, he was about 10 months. Okay. I've been there. That's the difference yeah. between Adelaide and Darwin. Yes. <laughs> it's a little bit of a surprise. <laughs> it was a bit of a shock. Yeah. I always feel sort of torn sharing that we got pregnant by accident because it's not something I take lightly. And I, I know how hard people work to expand their families. And so I always have this trepidation around like he wasn't planned, but that's the reality. Mm -hmm. We were very, very surprised to find out we were pregnant. Because it took you a little while to get pregnant with Charlie, right? Yeah. I mean, I emphasis on the little while. I think um, like Cooper, it only, it was like the second time I ovulated, I got pregnant. And Mm -hmm. then Charlie, it was about four months, which relatively speaking for me, I was concerned but I know, like, in the grand scheme of things, like, that's... Yeah, but you were actively tracking and trying versus surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So then did you decide to... Well, let's hear how your pregnancy went with him first. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can kind of back up a bit, too, of, like, what happened. Okay. Because it's it's sort of funny. Um, so that November, so it was, like, November 2017, we had come off of Thanksgiving at my mom's and like any family travel, it was a ton of work. And Cooper was a pretty much a fresh three and Charlie was about 10 months. And there was definitely moments where Andrew and I looked at each other and we were like, two's good. We're, we're good. We do not have to have more kids. And, um, I hadn't been on birth control since before I started trying for Cooper. And that was like five years ago at this point, at least. Um, mostly cause I suffer from migraines that get triggered by my hormones around ovulation and menstruation, which, you know, I've reached out to you for help <laughs> with some oil stuff with yeah. that. So I had gotten really good at sort of doing the more family planning method, which, I mean, I thought I was good at it. And around the end of November, we had gotten home and things happened. I don't need to go into the gory details. Obviously my parents are also going to listen to this, so I'm sorry. Um, but that's the facts. And, um, anyway, we got home and I could sort of tell the next day based on my cervical mucus that I might have messed up because it was very much ovulation time. And so I like ran to the app and lo and behold, it was like four days from ovulation. And so I had a bit of a panic set in and I was like rushing through all the months back from when we were trying to get pregnant with Charlie. And I saw that there were some unsuccessful months where we had, you know, had unprotected sex, like four days of ovulation. And so I took some comfort because I was like, okay, I'm, I'm sure we're going to be fine. And I was nervous because Charlie was only 10 months old. I had just been back at work for like four months and I had returned to work in a different role. Um, and so I was, I was quite nervous. And so like two weeks had passed and there was a morning where I woke up and I, and I knew I was supposed to get my period that morning. And so I went and took the test and I grabbed it and I just like, I peed on it. I put it on the counter and I was thinking like, you're being ridiculous. You are not pregnant. And I was pretty much laughing at myself, but before the timer could go off, I could see that it was positive. And I immediately texted my best friend, Carolyn saying, please tell me my eyes are lying. And she quickly wrote back and she was like, nope, that's positive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And my first reaction was to just start bawling. Uh, I was so overwhelmed all at once. And like, there is nothing I love more than being a mom. Um, And I am a birth junkie. But in that moment, I was just like, holy shit. (laughs) No, it was just the timing. And, you know, I just figured out some dietary stuff with my migraines and I felt a lot of guilt because I was very grateful for working parts and I knew that people would, you know, do anything to be in that position, but that was just sort of the reality that I was in. And so Andrew walked into the bathroom and I was just, I looked at him and I said, you're going to be mad at me for the story's sake. We were in the process of furnishing part of our house. We hadn't gotten around to it because we had moved into our house right before Charlie was born And he had sent me this long list of furniture ideas for the room. And so his first thought when I said, you're going to be mad at me was you didn't like any of the furniture I sent you. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I was just like, I'm pregnant. And I immediately started bawling and I buried my head in his chest and he just sort of laughed and he was actually happier than I was about it. And <laughs> that was because he didn't, you know, like the stress of not having a try and not having to make any decisions around whether or not to have two or three kids. Like, you know, we, the decision was made for us and, um, I don't know. That definitely put a pep in my step. Um, but that day I could just not focus on work. And thankfully I was able to move some things around. I came home and I just like ended up taking three more pregnancy tests to be sure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I think I started to get a little bit more like excited and happy, but you know, I was feeling all the things Yeah. and mentally it was hard in the beginning. I felt like the transition from one to two was challenging for me. Thankfully Mm -hmm. the pregnancy itself was great. I really like no morning sickness. Um, the biggest thing was just the discomfort that got, that I got pretty much right away. And I don't know if it was like my body just saying like, well, okay, I know, I know what to do, but my pelvic area was so uncomfortable starting around 14 weeks. And so I started going to the chiropractor pretty much right away, which was a godsend. And I really can't recommend the chiropractor enough for helping with those pregnancy aches and pains, but that was that. And I started with my doctor group that I had Charlie with, which I love so much. And so, yeah. All right. So nothing else to share from the pregnancy? There was this one piece of it um, that was pretty frustrating um, with figuring out my due date. And sometimes I feel like it's helpful to share because due dates are due dates. Everyone thinks it's like D-Day. I don't know. And like I knew exactly when I got pregnant with Liam. um, And I talk about this a bit in the previous stories. But my cycle is just so long that the whole dating back to your last missed period isn't super straightforward for me. Um, Cooper's due date moved back a whole due date. His original due date was um, July 28th, and it moved to August 4th. Mm. And then he was born six days late on August 10th. Yeah. Charlie's original due date was December 23rd. It moved back or it moved to December 28th, and then he was born five days late on January 2nd. And so it's almost like I really sort of bake babies till 42 weeks ish. Mm -hmm. And so it ends up working in my favor that they move it because I try to, you know, I want to avoid induction. Right. And uh, the same thing happened with Liam, but Liam's was different because it kept bouncing around and I had to have the vaginal ultrasound like three times. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. Once is enough. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they were worried. Sorry, they were never worried. It was just that I had the ultrasound when I was six weeks, but measured five. And then I went back at eight weeks and measured 10 weeks. So then I had to go back again. And then I was measuring back at a more appropriate date, I think. I can't remember exactly, but I was pushing for the latest date possible because, again, I didn't want to deal with any induction, especially because I was going for a VBAC again. Mm -hmm. So long story short, my due date with Liam went from, I think it was the 24th of August to the 31st. So I was happy with that because it was buying me time. Yeah. All right. So did you do anything differently to prepare for birth this time or how'd that go? So it's funny. I did so much to prepare for Charlie, just Mm -hmm. the whole going into my first vaginal birth. And then I think just, I don't know if it's life with two kids and working full time, but I did not put as much brain power into what this delivery would be like. And I don't know. There's, there's pros and cons to that. I mean, at the end of the day, I was distracted and there really wasn't much that I could do, but I think leading up to the birth, like as I got closer and closer, I was sort of like crash listening to your podcast because I was like, I need to get in this mindset. Like I need to know that this is happening. I need to be prepared just mentally. Um, but that was basically kind of all that I could do. I was just sort of trusting that my, that everything would be fine because everything was fine with Charlie. Yeah. And it had been so recent too. <laughs> and it, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. I forget that part too. <laughs> yeah. So you had I just done a lot of prep. Just done it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it was still fresh. Um, but, um, I think leading up the final weeks, I was more of an emotional mess because I was exhausted and I felt like I couldn't keep up with the two kids and the house stuff and the nesting and the working full time and trying to be ready for the baby, which face it, like that was not happening. Um, and I really felt like I couldn't pay attention to my pregnancy and soak it up. And so, yeah, I was starting to have a little bit of, um, kind of guilt and anxiety leading up to the birth just cause I, you know, it's natural birth, it hurts. And I needed to, (laughs) to, I needed to to put it lightly. I needed to get some mental 
prep, but I remember sort of breaking down to a couple of my closest friends because I was all over the place and which, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. You're just at this point where you're over the pregnancy, but at the same time, the reality of another baby kind of seems more overwhelming than that. And Mm -hmm. I was really unsure how three kids would be. And I was just feeling all the things. And I think I needed a good cry and get all the, the thoughts in my head out. All right. So how did labor start for you with him? Okay. Well, I wish that was straightforward too. It wasn't (laughs) as straightforward as getting pregnant. So around 1030, uh, I have some dates here to help me. So it was Sunday, August 25th. So I was 39 weeks, almost exactly. I thought my water broke and my water had never broken with my other kids. And so I texted my doula and she said, you know, put on a pad, go back to bed, get some rest. I called my mom who lives in San Luis Obispo, who, which is like three hours away. And I asked her to drive up just in case she was there for Charlie's birth and I really wanted to have her with us again. Um, and the next morning I woke up feeling mostly normal. My pad was dry. I had talked to my doula. Her name is Jennifer about calling the on-call doctor from my group just to be sure. And, um, they recommended that I come into labor and delivery just to confirm if it was my water or not. Um, they do this sort of uh, cotton swab test and I was really paranoid that they would say it was broken and make me stay. And it brought back a lot of fears from Cooper's birth when I had gone to the hospital too early and my water broke. I was like three centimeters when he broke my water at three centimeters. But the nurse was really sweet. They did the test and then we had to wait an hour for the results. And in that hour, my mind was racing just with like all the things that could happen if they had to make me stay. And I emailed my doctor basically telling him that I would be declining being admitted if they said it was positive because I had no other signs of labor. And I hit send and not two minutes later, the nurse came back and said it was negative. (laughs) So I was able to go home. Um, and he was great about it all, but lots of walking, lots of random inconsistent contractions, lots of Braxton Hicks. And I'm still like two weeks out from my due date. Um, and leading up to my 40 week appointment, I was going back and forth about getting a cervical exam. I knew it wasn't necessary, but the suspense was killing me. And I will talk about it a little bit later, but just this, uh, hesitation with interventions and a cervical exam is technically an intervention. And I knew it wasn't necessary, but I was dying to know where I was at just because I'd basically already been in labor on and off for a week. And so at that appointment, I had my doctor check me and I was soft and barely a one. And he had offered to strip my membranes. And I said, no, because I think I was just before 40 weeks. And, um, so my due date, August 31st came and went, I was still having these random pockets of contractions, usually usually at night when I was sleeping on my side. And then, um, at 40 weeks and three days, um, I went in for my weekly appointment and learned that my doctor does uh, non-stress tests at 40 weeks, I guess, just to back up. He was out of town at this point for me with Charlie. And so I didn't have a non-stress test. Um, I don't think at all with Charlie actually. Um, and I had texted my doula freaked out <laughs> again, intervention, me freaking out. Um, uh, but she calmed me down And, um, I'm just, I'm super apprehensive and unfortunately just assume the worst of medical staff when it comes to them. Um, so it takes me a bit to just like kind of come down off my horse of like, I don't need that. And I'm like, okay, wait, maybe, yes, maybe I do. Um, but the NST went great. Um, my Dr. R came in and we were chatting away and he asked to check me again. And I was all for it because of all the uh, prodromal labor I'd been having and so he goes in to check me and he's feeling around and all of a sudden he's like, whoa, you're four centimeters, Caitlin. And I couldn't believe it. And, um, you know, he asked again to strip my membranes and offered to break my mo- my water if I really wanted to get things going. Obviously I said no to breaking my bag, but I told him to strip my membranes. Um, and I knew he really wanted to deliver, to deliver this baby. I think he was trying to get things going because he was going to be out of town for a few days. I just have the worst luck with him, I guess. And, um, so yeah, he stripped my membranes and he was like, see you tonight. And so I left the office pumped and, you know, within a couple of hours, labor started and things were moving. Um, we got the boys to bed and and I went on a long walk and I finally got myself into, into bed and I went to sleep around 1 AM. And so the next day, September 4th, around 5 30, things picked up again. So Andrew and I went out walking again. And by this point, both of our moms were staying at our house to help with the boys and be on baby watch with us. Um, and that day I went to an intense acupuncture session. This amazing acupuncturist squeezed me in after I told her about my labor starting and stopping. And she did 
a three hour session on me. It was an hour and a half with a break in the middle for me to go on a long walk and then another hour and a half. Um, so if you're in the Bay area and you want a good acupuncturist, feel free to reach out. But she had offered to come into the next, into the office the next day, even though she wasn't going to be working. So I had that on standby, but then I started to lose huge amounts of mucus, which I knew I had a, I had a sense that things were going to be starting soon because that's how my labor started with Cooper. And so I did lots of walking. I was still having contractions. Um, and then my doula had a suspicion that maybe it had to do with just how Liam was positioning. And so she recommended that I do spinning babies and something called the three sisters, which is, um, rebozo shifting forward leaning inversion and side lying release. Um, YouTube was very helpful for these. Um, we used a scarf for the rebozo. It was very makeshift cause I don't have a legit rebozo, but, um, she also had me explore the whole idea of if I'm ready to be a mom of three, which at first I was borderline offended by, but I think in her heart, she felt like I was holding things in, which in retrospect I probably was. And I was feeling a ton of anxiety. Like I mentioned before about the pain and my plan was to do exactly as I did with Charlie and an unmedicated, an unmedicated birth is awesome and empowering. And it's the most amazing thing I had ever done, but it's nothing like I had experienced before. And as I started to re-remember it, I was feeling, you know, uneasy about like what I was going back into. And I don't know. I mean, you've had three unmedicated births. I don't know if you felt like. I feel like I forget. (laughs) And then when I'm in it, I'm like, oh my gosh, this hurts so bad. I forgot. Yeah. I mean, you do, you do forget, (laughs) but I was like starting to remember stuff like Mm -hmm. the red fire. And I was just like, I think I was stressing myself out unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, I just knew too much. And so we talked through that and we talked through my options and she, you know, assured me that if I got to the point where I needed interventions, she would be there for me. And I think that in and of itself was really comforting. I think in my heart, I just didn't want to disappoint her. And I, it's, I, you know, unfortunately it's the people pleaser in me and I didn't want to like make Jennifer sad by getting an epidural or something, which is so ridiculous, but that's just, that's where I was at mentally. And so, um, so Thursday, September 5th, I started feeling a bit funny. Oh, and I actually ended up writing a letter to Liam that day of like, just all the things on my heart around, like, I'm sorry for, oh my God, I hope I don't get emotional. I was like, I'm sorry for not being excited about you initially. And like, um, like how excited I was to meet him and how amazing his big brothers were. And I just tried to like, I don't know, subconsciously like release maybe the stuff that I was holding in. Um, and so that was, that was nice for me. And anyway, so Thursday, September 5th, I started feeling kind of funny. And at this point, Dr. R was officially out of town, um, which I think was also causing unnecessary pressure because I really wanted him to deliver Liam. He wasn't able to deliver Charlie. And I explored going back to acupuncture, but my doula encouraged me to just give my body a day to just be. And so then Friday, September 6th, so now we're pushing 41 weeks um, late Friday, September 6th, I'd basically given up. Um, I was like, this baby's never coming out. I booked a massage, um, which was kind of like a labor inducing massage. But I, after that, I had no motivation to leave the house. We were supposed to take Cooper to the park for a play date. And I just remember being like, I can't do this, which is very unlike me to to decline like any sort of social event. So, um, Andrew had a, he had texted me, he's like, maybe this is your, your labor starting. And I responded, this would be a very funny way for labor to be starting if it is, but we had peanut butter and jelly for dinner. Like that's how tired I was. And, um, that was that. So then Saturday, September 7th, I'm exactly 41 weeks at 4am. I woke up cramping. Um, but at this point I'm just jaded. So (laughs) I was super cautious because of my two weeks of false alarms. And I stayed in bed for a bit as they came on and just kind of hung up by myself. And I was getting them laying on my side, like I had been, and I was a little more nervous to move out of fear of things stopping. Cause if I'd go to sleep, things would stop. If I'd get up, things would stop. And so I decided to get up and do some stair stepping in our living room. And I did some lunges with my foot elevated to get things going. And that brought on my contractions like crazy. Um, just having my foot like elevated up two stairs and then doing a lunge. And so I hung out in our bathroom for a bit and I, I finally was confident that things were really happening. And so around 530, I got Andrew up and told my mom that she should probably get dressed. And Andrew and I went for a walk. Um, and I forgot to mention through all of this, I have a 
a birth photographer and she is this sweet, sweet woman. And so throughout these two weeks, I am, and she's on call for me. So I was texting her, keeping her posted. And so Andrew and I went out for a walk. I texted my photographer, um, and we had been walking for close to an hour and I got to the point where I needed to stop walking and hold his hand or pull on his jacket and breathe through contractions. And so I called Jennifer Madula around six fifteen, and told her what was up. And she knew I didn't want to stay at home too long because I had already been four centimeters a week before with, you know, labor on and off in between. And I was antsy to get to the hospital because I just, I didn't know where I was at. Um, and I really didn't want to have a baby in my living room. And I also wanted to get out of the house before my kids woke up because I wasn't sure selfishly what that would do to my labor. Um, and so about six 30, we were ready to leave. So that night Cooper had actually crawled into bed with us. And so when I went to leave, I felt bad about not saying anything to him. And so I crawled into bed with him to say goodbye and gently woke him up. And I told him it was time for the baby to come. And I totally didn't expect it, but he got pretty emotional, um, which made me fall into a million pieces. And he asked for me to lay with him. And I did, which was so amazing. And I laid with him for about 10 minutes. And the crazy thing is that my contractions absolutely stopped for those 10 minutes for me to just be with him. And I thought he was going to respond with something super sweet. And he just said, can I watch (laughs) Spider-Man? So I put on Netflix and we left the house um, and contractions picked right up, which I was thankful for. But I was immediately reminded of how unpleasant car contractions are, but we eventually made it to the labor and delivery floor. And between contractions, I was still pretty coherent. So when I walked up, I told them I was in labor and I don't think they thought I was for real. So they just started checking me in and casually asked, you know, is this your first baby? And I said, no, it's my third. And you can kind of see their faces go like, oh shit, (laughs) she's for real. And, um, they were going to take me to some triage room and they asked at the last minute, were you dilated at your last appointment? And I said, yeah, I was, I was four centimeters and they just kind of all switched gears and were like, nope, take her over there. And so I don't even know what any of that meant, but they took me to, I think they took me to an actual delivery room. And so checking in was quite a different experience because when I got to the hospital with Charlie, I was already on another planet. I was going through transition already. And so this time being able to answer questions between contractions was pretty surreal. I was sort of just sitting on the bed, managing each contraction as it would come. And they had no, they knew and asked about my prior C-section with Cooper, um, and asked about Charlie's birth being a V-back. And it was interesting because, uh, the nurse referred to me as TOLAC. Um, she's like, so you're TOLAC, which is a trial of labor after cesarean. And I despise that word because I think it's, just rude. You're giving me a a chance to try and labor. Um, and I told her, I was like, I know you didn't make up that word, but I really hate it. She's like, I know it's terrible, isn't it? So I immediately liked my nurse because she was, she seemed to be sort of, I don't know, in my, in my brain space, if that makes sense. And (laughs) there was another nurse who had come in and had Andrew sign this waiver about knowing the risks of VBAC, which I didn't remember at all from last time. And I was kind of annoyed about, because she was muttering something to him about uterine rupture and I was right there laboring my second be back. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was pretty surprised by that, but I just chose to let it go. And my nurse read through my birth preferences, which I had from Charlie's birth too, and was super respectful about them. And she knew that I wanted, um, so since Dr. R was out of the office, it was Dr. L. Um, and I've referred to her in the previous stories was sort of my, my, my backup doctor and throughout this pregnancy, I actually saw them both just in case this would happen. And she knew I wanted Dr. L to deliver me. So she mentioned if she could check me, it would help her so she could give enough heads up to the hospital. Um, and I was really appreciative that she was so respectful of, um, just asking me about if I wanted to be checked or not. And so I ended up being fine with that. And she checked me and I was six centimeters. So I definitely made some progress through the week and things started to pick up around nine, nine thirty. And I walked the halls a bit with Andrew and came back to the room. I Weirdly, I preferred sitting through contractions this time, which was the total opposite of Charlie's labor. And I think, I think I was standing for a majority of the 19 hours I was in labor with Charlie. But for whatever reason, I was coping well while sitting. And Jennifer, my doula, dropped the foot of the bed to make it more of a seat. And she massaged me for a while while Andrew was putting pressure on my lower back, which was mandatory for every contraction again. Um, I wasn't having back labor, but I needed some pressure to just, I don't know, it, the pressure on my back kind of took the edge off of the contraction and helped me manage through it. And so eventually I went into the shower and I sat on the bench in there and Jennifer sprayed my back with hot water while Andrew did the counter pressure. 
Eventually I got out of the shower and went back to the bed. And this time Jennifer was rubbering, or she was actually kind of like almost jabbing her nail into the pressure points on my feet, which it was painful. I eventually had to ask her to stop because it was almost like worse than the contractions. Um, but she had me sipping Arnica, which she said would help with, uh, some bruising. And there was a lot of kind of burying myself into Andrew's chest. Um, and my nurse came back around 11 AM to check me and, and she actually left the room without telling me where I was at, which I loved, but I was also like, Oh, <laughs> where am I? Um, but turns out I was seven centimeters and she was going to come back in an hour to check me again so that she could keep Dr. L posted. And she kept saying that if I feel any pushy feelings to tell her immediately. And so at this point, because we had an hour until she was coming back, I went back in the shower and that's where things got really intense. Um, I don't, I think I was in the shower for, well, I was in the shower for about an hour and, um, I felt like things had really amplified and I was getting ready to call uncle. I was having insanely intense contractions and I just kind of got to the point where I was like, what am I doing? (laughs) I was basically talking myself into the epidural, telling myself, you've done this before. You don't need to do this again. You don't need to be in agony. You will get your V back. Um, and I told Andrew and Jennifer that I was strongly considering it. And Jennifer was amazing and completely nonjudgmental. And she was like, okay, let's talk to the nurse when she comes back. And in retrospect, I think she was sort of just playing it cool for me because I think you don't know this till it's over. But like once the same thing happened with Charlie, like once you think you can't do it anymore and once you're ready to be done, you really are almost done. I think I've, I've mentioned that before. Um, and she, but she also had mentioned in that moment, she's like, you know, breaking your water could help speed things along. Cause at that point we knew I was pretty far along, but I was so afraid of everything coming that breaking my water was just an absolute no. And so finally around 12, I had had enough. I wanted out of the shower and I wanted drugs in my body. And we stood up from the shower and that next contraction while standing in the bathroom was entirely pushy. Um, so it's just the irony of like being done. And then just, I started to push. And so we got me to the bed where I was on my knees with my body over the head of the bed again. Um, And we called the nurse because of how pushy I felt. And they really wanted to check me to see where I was at because Dr. L wasn't there yet. And so I think you and I actually texted about this, Bryn. But so finally, they needed to get an idea of where I was at. They were like, you can see in the pictures my photographer took, the the nursing staff was a bit panicked because they were like, is this baby coming? Because I was a third time mom. They didn't know where I was at. And so they had the hospitalist, which I hope that's the correct terminology. I think that's what me and Andrew remember them calling this OB that was just at the hospital, but she wasn't from my doctor group. She came in and this is where things got interesting. She introduced herself and she was like, hi, I'm Dr. Kim and I'm I'm here to check you. And I said, I'm having a contraction. Can you please wait? And I'm sure I said this very calmly. (laughs) I'm being sarcastic, but No, um, she proceeded to check me anyway, and she full on went into my butthole and I was like, you are in the wrong hole. Can you please wait? And she again, didn't listen. Um, and then pretty much overcompensated and basically went in the complete other direction. So again, I was like, you are in the wrong hole. Can you please wait? And then she, and she got up and she was like, I'm not checking her. And my photographer said it was quite dramatic with her like flinging the bloody glove off onto the floor. But I was pissed and I started hysterically crying. Like, why couldn't she wait? And everyone was just shocked at what happened. Like Andrew, my mom, my doula, everyone was just kind of like, what the hell just happened? She was like so forceful of knowing where I was at, but she like wouldn't listen. And I'm in the middle of a contraction and it was just it was nuts. And so everything, I mean, thankfully what felt like two seconds later, my doctor walked in in all her glory, like literally jeans and a t-shirt with her purse straight from her car to me. (laughs) I love her forever. And just said calmly, I know she's like, Caitlin, I know you're feeling pushy. So we need to see where you're at. And I had a break in my contraction. So I was happy to oblige. I got on my side. She checked me. Um, I was eight centimeters and they were, so they, they were nervous about me pushing and damaging my cervix, not being complete. She felt his head right there and, rem- and recommended that we break my water too. Um, she felt like once my water had broken, it would be super fast. Um, but I was hesitant again because of intervention and I kind of just looked at my doula and Dr. L and I was like, if you guys both agree that we should break my water, let's just do it. And they did. And so we did it and that was it. They broke my water. 
Um, I felt this huge warm gush while I was on my side and I was trying so hard to not bear down my, bear down in my contractions and all the nurses were trying to help me breathe differently. I was like trying to push and they're like, breathe, breathe. And then I have Jennifer in my ear telling me, just listen to your body. Your body knows what to do. So it's like the angel and the devil. Um, and it's funny because Andrew love that man. Um, he recorded, he did an audio recording of the last 35 minutes of Liam's birth for me, because I guess after Charlie's, I was like, what did I sound like? Was I, cause you feel like you're a crazy animal. Um, and you're just kind of like out of yourself. And so I was asking him a lot of questions about like what I was like. And so he just took it amongst himself to, he's like, well, if you're asking these questions, I'll just record you. Um, and so it's very hard to listen to the recording, but you know, I'm saying I'm trying, I'm trying. And, um, like I was trying to not bear down with all of these contractions, but it was so hard to go against what my body was trying to do as anybody who's being told to resist that, um, fetal ejection reflex, like it's impossible. But after 20 or 30 minutes, Dr. L came back and checked me and I had a bit of cervix left, but then after two or three contractions, I was complete and able to push. And so once I was allowed to push, it was, it all happened super fast. And Liam was coming down a bit crooked and Dr. L could see the cord around his neck. So she hopped up on the table and was able to get the cord out from around his neck while he was coming out and then quickly had me get on my back and then told me to give one big push because she was worried about uh, shoulder dystocia. But he was out in two pushes, all 10 pounds, three ounces of him. And he was placed on my chest and he took about 35 seconds to start crying, which was unnerving. Um, I didn't see his face for so long. It felt like because I had the back of his head where they're like, you know, like shaking him to get him to you know, stimulate him to cry. But he finally did. And it was insane. And I looked straight over at Andrew and said, I'm never doing that again. But I immediately was so happy that it was over. And I was immediately so head over heels for him. And I think that was the biggest relief, like all that apprehension and worry throughout my pregnancy was just like absolutely gone. Um, And I was instantly obsessed with him. (laughs) Oh, that was like a whirlwind there at the end. Yeah, it was. I mean, his labor was only eight hours. So Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I mean, it was significantly faster than Charlie. Not as fast as a lot of people, but. Yeah. It sounds like your body had been doing the work for like a week or more too. Yeah. I felt, yeah, I got four, four centimeters for free, I say. Yeah. So how was your postpartum with him and with three kiddos total? Yeah, well, so they immediately postpartum, he was a big guy, so they had to test his blood sugars for the first four feedings, but those went great. The biggest hurdle we faced was actually something called Coombs, and it's something we experienced with Charlie, but it was nowhere near as severe. But the Coombs test is uh, a test for blood type incompatibility between the mom and the baby. Um, and Charlie and Liam both had positive tests, which you don't want to have a positive test because it leads to high levels of bilirubin. I'm O positive and Andrew is AB and I didn't know this until Charlie, but I guess O positive has antibodies for AB blood. And since I make A or B babies, I guess my body essentially attacks their blood. And so it's something I didn't know until Liam, but Coombs can get the intensity of Coombs can get worse with each baby because my body has already built up those antibodies. So once the baby is born, it all happens in their bodies a lot faster. Mm. And so at seven hours of life, Liam's numbers were high risk. And so they had to admit him to the NICU to do phototherapy. Um, and we were there from Saturday to late Tuesday night. Basically he was, he had a phototherapy like coming from the side and above him. And Coombs isn't, it's not, um, like you can manage it really easily. So it's not life threatening, but I was, I mean, as any mom would be like those new, those new baby snuggles are all you want. Um, and so I was really upset that he had to be in the NICU, but I have such respect for NICU moms. I feel like I got like a taste of it. And so the moms have to spend, spend, you know, weeks and months there. I like, they're my heroes. It's, it was, um, it was really hard, but postpartum itself um, was great. I, I almost had to keep reminding myself that I was only like two weeks postpartum or like a week postpartum because you get back into the swing with, you know, three kids and you don't really have a choice (laughs) or at least I felt like I didn't. Um, I know people can be really adamant about sort of weighing in, but I'm not the type to lay in general. Um, I definitely took advantage of those baby snuggles, but I felt like I was sort of like up with it pretty quick and felt great. Like a lot of that, like heavy feeling that I had with Charlie just vaginally, I had none of. So it was really just, I was a little bit uncomfortable, but mostly just 
you know, managing sort of the postpartum blood, but otherwise I felt really good. Breastfeeding um, is not an easy journey for us whatsoever. Um, but I think I gained a lot of perspective, at least with Charlie, about my body and having kind of a, a low glandular tissue. And um, I just decided from the get go that I would nurse him and then top him off with a bottle and not stress myself out about it, which I don't know if there's something biological. I think no matter what, at least for me, I couldn't help but stress out about it. I feel like breast milk is like a drug, like you see it and then you want more of it. <laughs> so I kept having to kind of talk myself off the ledge and be realistic, especially having the three kids. But um, I felt at least a bit more sane this time, which was, which was good. So were there any new resources you wanted to share or any you just want to re-mention from previous ones? And then we'll, of course, link to your other episodes. Yeah. I mean, the biggest problem, the biggest two were um, your podcast, The Birth Hour, obviously, a diehard fan. Mm-hmm. Um, and then <laughs> Spinning Babies were the main things I took advantage of this time, mm-hmm. as well as there's another podcast called The VBAC Link, which is VBAC Stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was a newer one. But previously, sort of uh, VBAC Facts is great. Um, Ina May, her book is great. Um, I think everybody talks about that book. Um, but that was the biggest, those were the biggest things. Okay. All right. And then where is the best place for people to connect with you? Um, I do have an Instagram account. Uh, it's Kate Shrum, um, is the handle C A I T S H R U M. Um, happy to have you follow along. I, I mentioned this, but it is private just cause I get creeped out by creepy people. Um, but none of this community is creepy people. So feel free to follow along. Um, but yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for sharing, Caitlin. You are welcome. Now I'm going to chat with Katie about Motif Medical, today's sponsor. Hi, Katie. Thanks for coming on the birth hour today to chat with me about Motif's breast pumps. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you before we get into chatting about pumps? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I live in Black Mountain, uh, North Carolina, and we have two kids, um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Her birthday is actually on Thursday. Uh, my son just turned one too. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. It's wild. They grow up so fast. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hear a little bit about your pumping journey. Are you working full time or when do you mostly pump? So when I had my first baby, I worked, uh, at the hospital full time. So three 12 hour days. Um, so I definitely was doing a lot more pumping then. Now I stay at home and I pump usually twice a day or if I miss, um, a feeding, then I'll pump. Mm -hmm. Um, when I first had Lou, my one year old and was pumping more often, um, now it's kind of fallen off a little bit now since she's getting older but just in that those first few months trying to build up a milk supply I would feed her on one side and pump the other oh wow to make sure that she and I actually started doing that with my first I liked that because I felt like it made sure that he got all of the fore milk and all of the hind milk Mm -hmm. so I would feed him drain one side and then pump the other was that something you just started doing or did a lactation counselor give you that tip So actually my sister-in-law is a labor and delivery nurse. Um, and that was her advice. Okay. She didn't have a lot of hind milk Mm -hmm. when she had her babies. I ended up having a lot of hind milk as I found for my pumping. And cause Mac was a gigantic, tiny human, (laughs) (laughs) but I would pump every time I fed. So like just about every four hours and with him, because I was pumping so much, I also was like way overproducing and didn't really realize that. Yeah. <laughs> that that's what the cause was. Mm-hmm. And I would pump like 16 ounces every time I pumped, <laughs> um, which was <laughs> oh like 16 while ounces. While you were nursing too? While I was nursing. Oh my gosh. It was what did you do crazy. with all that milk? We donated a lot of it. Um, We had a friend who had fostered a newborn Mm -hmm. around the same time that Mac was born. Mm -hmm. Um, So we were able to give most of it to them. Um, We kept enough to like feed Mac when I was at work. Yeah. But yeah, we gave most of it away. And then we saved about 3,000 ounces for when we stopped breastfeeding Mm -hmm. so that we could like slowly transition 
um, him to whole milk. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, even that only lasted like a couple months. Wow. Um, <laughs> Because he just ate so much. Yeah. <laughs> so that was with Mac. And then with Lou, our um, daughter, I started doing the same thing. But because I wasn't working, I didn't feel like I needed such a huge um, storage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would feed her on one side and pump the other. But I would only do it like every other time I fed her. Okay. But what I really noticed was that with the Luna, when I started using it, that I would get like eight to 10 ounces in about 10 minutes. So it was a lot faster yeah. to get it out. Expression yes. is the Versus word I was like, for. <laughs> Yeah. And okay. like the first, the first time when I was pumping with Mac, um, with that pump, I would, I would get I would get a lot of milk, but it would take like 30 minutes. Interesting. And like it was loud. I didn't really do anything while I was pumping. Mm -hmm. Having the duo was really convenient because Lou would wake up and I would feed her and then I would have to pump. It always ended up being like eight o'clock when I needed to pump. And that's what time I have to take Mac to school. Okay. So with the duo, I was able to just pump in the car, which was really nice. Because it's a portable pump, it is a little less powerful just because, mm-hmm. I mean, the nature of it, the engine's smaller. And- yeah, it's tiny, you guys. It weighs less than a pound. It fits, like, in the palm of your hand, basically, yeah. but it's still an electric pump, and it's battery-operated, yes. right? Right, yeah, it's rechargeable. So, yeah, I would just, like, grab it and a, and a flange and jump in the car and pump on the way to school, and, like, it takes maybe 10 minutes to get to max school, so I'd always be done pumping by the time I got there, and I would usually have like five or six ounces in that amount of time, which like isn't as much as with the Luna, but it still was enough, you know, I wasn't like fully emptying, but you're not really supposed to do that anyway. So yeah, (laughs) but yeah, that was super convenient. And then at night I also found that I could like pump while I was cooking dinner or like cooking breakfast or whatever. I would just like stick it in my back pocket and pump, which was really nice. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm looking at it now and I'm like, Ooh, I have the Luna, which I I love. I agree. (laughs) It does pump really fast. Like I was just, I just had to pump that in a, an event. And my friend, when I came out, she was like, you're done already. I was like, yeah, Yeah. it's really fast. Um, but yeah, this duo looks pretty cool too, as far as just convenience and portability. Yeah. Well, and like, as far as the speed goes, like, I remember I got, I fortunately working at a hospital got break at additional breaks to pump Mm -hmm. that were like kind of unlimited Mm -hmm. and usually had to be gone for like 20 to 30 minutes. And I wish now that I had had the Luna then because it, I'm, I pump, I usually stop pumping at 10 minutes just because that's like, as much time as I usually have in my day. Right. (laughs) It's like spare time. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, if I could have gotten that amount of milk in that amount of time when I was working, it would have been so much easier to take. Yeah. (laughs) To take breaks during the day. Yeah. I used another brand when I was working with my second. And I remember like I felt so rushed to like yeah wash all the parts afterwards because the pumping yeah. took my entire time so I ended up you know starting to do the thing where you put all the parts in a ziploc bag and just keep them in the oh, fridge yeah. and stuff like that but yeah um, yeah it, this one it is significantly faster it's very cool mm-hmm. and like you mentioned it's so quiet I, I yeah. used it at this event and I was just in like a little portable changing tent and nobody could even hear it <laughs> it yeah. was very yes. cool Yeah, I had to pump in like the middle of the night. I got home late from a conference the other day and it was like one o'clock in the morning and I had to pump and it didn't even wake up my husband. (laughs) Like he didn't even know I was pumping, Um, which was really nice. And it has a nightlight on it too that I didn't even realize this till the other night, but you can turn the nightlight on even if the pump isn't on. On the Luna? Yes. Okay, this is news to me too. I now. know, I know, which was so nice because I was like trying so hard not to wake Alex up and and I was like fumbling around and then I was like, Oh, well, maybe the light will turn on. So I hit the light button and it turned on and I was like, Oh, this is great. I can see That's it's not awesome. super bright, like I don't have to turn on like an overhead light and 
but and also the pump wasn't running so like after I was done I just turned the pump off and put my milk in bags and with the light with the light I didn't have to like take it all downstairs or whatever that's awesome very cool thanks for sharing that That, that's a new feature to me (laughs) yeah I know I yeah same I I was excited to find that out (laughs) was there anything else you want to share about either pump I was gonna say that with the duo actually at the same I was at a conference in Nashville it was all day it was from like eight to five or eight to six um and I had to pump every four hours because that's how often Lou eats like you know I mean as if you were at work right but I was in a theater with like seven thousand people (laughs) and I was in the second row of this of this conference and so every like four hours I just brought out my pump and was able to like very inconspicuously pump because it was quiet and it was quick and it, and it was small, you know, and like mm-hmm. wasn't bothering anybody. Nobody really noticed except like my friends who were sitting right next to me. Um, but I was so nervous being in like the second row that the people up on stage were going to be able to hear me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cause they were like talking. I mean, we're listening to speakers uh-huh. and but it was great. I pumped like 32 ounces that day. Wow. You're my hero. <laughs> and, like, I'm nobody still even like, knew. <laughs> I will nurse in front of anyone, but I'm still like, when it comes to pumping, I need my space, but I also have never had a handheld pump like that. So yeah. Yeah. Well, and it was cool. very, I've, I put a lot of thought into like what I was wearing. Right. And, That's you know, true. I brought like a little cooler that fit in my purse. That's and, so awesome. Um, <laughs> but that, yeah, that was really nice too. Cause I could just toss it in my purse. I didn't have to bring like a huge pump yeah. bag with me or like worry about getting up and like leaving to plug something in. Mm-hmm. I could just stay and do it all there. And like, record. I just like recorded notes on my phone. Nice. Um, so yeah, it was, that was like big time super mom moment for, for sure <laughs> <laughs> I love it yeah it was exciting all right well thank you so much Katie yeah. for sharing your experience with me I really appreciate it yeah totally thank you for having me on thank you so much again to Caitlin for sharing her birth story with us and to Katie for coming on and chatting with me about motif if you want more information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Caitlin's name in the search bar. And remember, if you want to listen to Caitlin's first two birth stories, those are available via our archives for our Patreon members. So you can join that by heading over to patreon.com slash birth hour. And it's a great time to join because we have that super fun giveaway going on as well. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.